Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. In the last part, we lost our Gliger, and now we have a team of five. But we have a few options. So we could grind up our Apom or our Ledian to be the final member of our team of six. Or, alternatively, we could use our Realgum Tower encounter to pad out the team. We only have two encounters left in the game, being Realgum Tower and Realgum Coliseum. And unfortunately, we can't get the Realgum Coliseum one without entering the final gauntlet of battles. Luckily, because we face the Cypher admins again in Realgum Tower, they still have their Shadow Pokemon from their previous fights. If I had to pick from the four of them, I'd want Suicune the most, but we're actually only limited to Sudowoodo or Entei before we're forced to encounter a Sunflora or a Delibird that's held by different Cypher peons. Now, this means we have to either fight Mirror B or Dakim first, and I decided to be bold. I want Entei. I'm not messing up again. I went back and forth in my head a lot about this one, because I knew I could catch Sudabuto easier, and that there was a chance of Entei killing itself like it did the first time. But I definitely want my revenge, so I decide to challenge Dakim first. I research his team and I find out that the fortress he has has explosion, so his team is immediately a threat. Now I definitely don't want to lose any more Pokemon going after another encounter, so I have to play it super carefully. I return to Outskirts Stand to get some more Ultra Balls for the fight, because I want to make sure I get him this time. I learned from my mistakes, it's not happening again. Returning to Realgum Tower, my strategy in the Dakin fight was simple. I had to take out his team before they could do too much damage to mine. I was scared of Fortress and the sunny day that was set up, because it might have powered up Entei enough where the Fire Blast would do some serious damage. Now Entei was only level 40 as compared to the rest of Dakin's team, so it actually couldn't hit us crazy hard anyway. Oh yeah, because there's going to be a ton of admin fights and boss battles in this part, expect a ton of sped up battles. I'm not going to comment on everything that happens in each individual battle, but there's a lot, so be prepared. Eventually, I get the Entei alone, and I strategically switch Hitmontop in and out on him, getting the Intimidate attack drops so it won't damage me or itself too much. With less attack, he'll do less recoil to himself, so it's a win-win. I definitely learned my lesson from last time, and this time I paralyze it, and I make sure not to damage him too much, as to give us more chances to throw balls at him. And finally, after a few of them, we got him. Our Realgum Tower encounter is Entei. Dakim struts out, and I realize that I'm going to have to do some serious work to get this Entei up to speed with the rest of my team. Luckily, we have a Time Flute, so we use it to purify him immediately, and... This is where we head back to Mount Battle, where I spend the next couple hours of my life beating up the same trainers over and over again until Entei was at a decent enough level that I could tolerate taking on the rest of Realgum Tower with. I give Entei the experience share so he can earn more XP per battle, and I start training him up with the rest of my team. I swear, I've literally spent half the time of this Nuzlocke on Mount Battle. It's unbelievable. While I'm on this level grind, I decide that I can grind for more Poke Coupons, and I decide I want to go for Flamethrower. So I do enough grinding, and as it turns out, Entei actually learns Flamethrower naturally at level 51 anyway, so I have some extra coupons left over. In case you guys aren't aware, Pokemon Coliseum has what I like to call a super unfair level jump, right at the very end of the game. The regular trainers we face have level 40s, sure, but the final bosses of the game have Pokemon in their late 50s and early 60s, which is outrageous when you compare it to the trainers leading up to them. If you were to play through Pokemon Coliseum at a normal pace, your Pokemon may be at level 50 by the time you get to the final boss. Maybe. That's without all of the extra grinding that I've done at Phoenix Stadium and Mount Battle. The level curve actually doesn't make any sense, so if it seems like I'm doing a lot of grinding recently, we're actually going to be under-leveled for the final boss fight of the game. Basically, now that we're in the endgame, the only things we have left to do are defeat the remaining three Cypher admins, Gonzap, all of the trainers in Realgum Tower, Cold Eyes, and Evice. I'm gonna get this TM for Brick Break if it's the last thing I do. So I head back to Pirate Coliseum, the place where my Gliger died. Looking at the teams of the upcoming opponents, it's really important I have a strong fighting type move in my arsenal so we absolutely need to get it before we progress any further through Realgum Tower. And I'm telling you guys, this game is out to get me. Five of the Pokemon in the Pirate Coliseum have Explosion in their moveset, 
including Nuzleaf, Boltoy, Graveler, Electrode, and Lunatone. They just absolutely want something to die. All right, for real though, who taught this Hoot Hoot Sky Attack? That's, this is what I mean when I say the game's getting ridiculous. So we reach the final battle of the Pyrite Coliseum, and there's only one trainer that stands in the way of me and Brick Break. Ryder Harrell has an Electrode and a Lunatone, who both not only have Protect, but who also have Explosion. I have to be seriously careful and play around them, as to not have a bomb go off on one of my weaker mods. It ends up alright, but I swear, Pokemon games should never cause this much stress. It was just a random NPC trainer too. Not a boss, not anything, but I was terrified of him. We complete Pyrite Coliseum, teach Hitmontop Brick Break, but accidentally get rid of Detect instead of Triple Kick. I did not mean to do that. Luckily, the Undershop has the TM for Protect readily available. This gives us a pretty good excuse to go back to the Undershop and get some more TMs to further buff out my Pokemon's movesets going into the end. We pass the old man who I guess is still having a heart attack, and we pick up some TMs for Protect, Reflect, and Light Screen. I teach Hitmontop Protect and Earthquake, and I teach Yanma Protect as well. I also teach Plusle Light Screen. I would have rather taught Plusle Reflect, but for some reason, she can only learn Light Screen. Which I don't understand, ask Game Freak. Now, there's only one Pokemon left that we have the ability to catch. So, I sell all my balls and all the junk that I'm not going to use, and I buy a ton of floor restores, prepping for the gauntlet of strong trainers. We head back to Realgum Tower, and face off against Mirror B. Unfortunately, his signature battle music doesn't play, so we're left with the standard Cypher Admin theme. Our Pokemon are much better than his, so we have very little trouble taking care of his team. Unlike last time, where I was horrified of going against him, back in part 1. You guys remember that. Although this time, he actually has full restores that heal his Pokemon. Because we passed up on Sudowoodo for Entei, the Sudowoodo got depressed, and Shadow rushes itself to death to finish the battle. That's fitting. Two admins down, two to go. We defeat the two trainers with the Shadow Sunflora and the Shadow Delibird, and now it's time for Venus again. Her Pokemon are actually not that much higher leveled than the last time, and we have very little trouble. Our rematch with Venus was actually fairly easy, all things considered, but her strategy still consists of using status moves like Thunder Wave, Attract, and Sweet Kiss, which actually made fighting her super annoying. Luckily, we had fairly good RNG throughout the entire fight, so we get by unscathed. And now we have to face off against Ayn one more time. We only fought him like a couple hours ago in game time, but for me, it's been several days. Things are going good until his Starmie goes for a Hydro Pump on my Plusle. Now I had a light screen up, and I'm higher level. But in the rain, a stab boosted Hydro Pump from a Starmie is still really, really scary. It showed up, and I was like, no, I was like, not Plusle, please. Anything but Plusle. But the game felt generous, and it missed. I actually went back in and I calced the damage it could have done, and I discovered that I was in no danger of dying even though it felt like I was. Even with full investment, Starmie still didn't kill Plusle, so I got super scared for nothing, huh? Anyways, we beat Ayn and we get an email from Grandpa that basically tells us to go to Aggie. We travel there, and he gives us the Master Ball. Well, great. This would have come in handy like a couple hours ago when I caught Entei, but you know what, Egan? Whatever. Alright, yeah, that's fine. We'll just go and save the world by ourselves. You can just sit there and watch your TV shows with your hag of a wife. Some legendary trainer you are, man. And then once again, we go back to the tower, and we use the four ID cards we got from each Cypher admin to open the main door, when we're rudely interrupted by a Cypher peon dropping from the ceiling. Honestly, at this point in the game, almost every single trainer has a strategy specifically for double battles. I wonder if Game Freak really knew what they were doing when they made the entire game consist of them. Oh, I forgot this part happened. Verde is pissed because we stole his Bayleaf way back in part 1. I only came in this room because I thought there'd be like a healing machine or something. So because there's a lot of longer battles at this point in the endgame, I want to be able to show them all, but sometimes I'll just lay the battle underneath some music to show that they went off without a hitch. Literally anything could go wrong in every battle from this point on. I said in part 1 that a big part of this Nuzlocke was going to be to minimize the risk as much as possible, 
And that's pretty much the logic I've used with every decision I've made in the run so far. So there's actually a lot of NPC trainers in Realgum Tower. Pretty sure because they want to prepare us for the last second level spike by giving us more trainers to grind off of. I think they were trying to prepare us, but nah, they weren't really thinking straight when they made the level jump in the first place, were they? <laughs> what? This guy is Silva? He's undercover? How did he get in here? Why do all these trainers now suddenly have a personality and unique cutscenes? What's happening in this game? After clearing out all of the trainers except the boss trainers, I wonder if my Pokemon are high enough level to take on the final two trainers in the game. I head to Mount Battle to train up Umbreon and Hitmontop, just enough so I can use rare candies on them. It only ended up being like two battles. I give two rare candies to Hitmontop and one to Umbreon. All of my Pokemon are level 58, except for Entei and Yanma, who are level 56. It's time to beat the game. We head up the elevator and encounter Cold Eyes, who says he'll be waiting for us at the top of the tower. There's so much suspense in the air, and I only get one shot at this. If I lose, then all of the grinding, all of the time, all the editing, it'll all have been for nothing. So I'm just shaking in my boots. I'm starting to really feel the pressure come on when... Oh... Another Cypher Peon? Way to kill off all the suspense. We get to the elevator and out steps Gonzap. You know, the guy from the opening cutscene that we've never seen in the story? Yeah. Yeah, that guy. He's impressed with how far we've gotten and asks us back to Team Snagum. But we've got better things to do, so he challenges us to a battle. And he gets the regular trainer battle theme? No special music for this guy? Really? Not even the Cypher admin theme? The disrespect! Gonzap's Pokemon are in the early 50s, so they're stronger than what we're used to, but we're still able to make it past him with all of our Pokemon intact. The only thing on his team that gave me any trouble at all was Hariyama, who would not stop earthquaking. So of course, before every big battle I'll look up the trainers that I'll need to face and their Pokemon's movesets, because I feel like this would be absolutely impossible without any prior knowledge of the game. Remember, the last time I played it was like 10 years ago. Once we go up the elevator, we're locked into our leads, and I ultimately decide to lead with Umbreon and Hitmontop because of the majority of the trainers we have to face before Cold Eyes and Evice are weak to fighting. Haha, <laughs> useless is stuck down there. See ya, I got a Nuzlocke to beat. We make it to the top of the tower, and we have to face off with the scariest trainer of all, Bodybuilder Jomas, the real head of Cypher. Nah, just kidding. She does have the first encounter of Realgum Coliseum though, being her mill tank. Because this is the last Pokemon we're allowed to catch, we toss the Master Ball at her. And of course, catch it. Yeah, I used a Master Ball on a mill tank. So what? If we went into the Coliseum with five Pokemon, mill tank would have come in handy, but unfortunately we went in with a full six, so this mill tank will never actually see the light of day. As it turns out, they actually don't heal your Pokemon between battles in this Colosseum, which completely surprised me. Luckily, the trainers are mostly super easy, so we're able to make it past them. Finally, we come face to face with Cold Eyes, and I'm just praying that they healed my Pokemon before this fight, because I need all the health and all the power points I can get. Interestingly, there's no music that plays in the NASCAR battle. It's just the cheering of the crowd and the noises that the Pokemon make which is actually a super interesting aesthetic choice as it makes every hit feel all the more important. Nascor's team is actually really scary, specifically his Blaziken, as I can't use my two bulkiest Pokemon of Meganium and Umbreon because his stab moves completely shred through them. His wall rain also posed an issue for my team, as I can't really hit him without him hitting me super effectively. Luckily, Hitmontop's able to get a critical hit brick break on the wall rain and we're in the clear for Nascor. I told you we needed Brick Break. We literally would not be able to beat this game without Brick Break. I'm not comfortable switching anyone in on this Dusclops because he actually has Destiny Bond, and I really don't want anyone to go down with him. At the very end of the battle, he's the only one left, and we Toxic Stall him, using Call to Waste turns, until he's in range for us to safely kill him. We got past Nascor without losing a single one of our Pokemon. I did not think we would get that far, or that lucky. Alright, well, that's that. Pokemon Coliseum... Wait. This fat mother... Yeah. Evice. 
the trainer that I've been dreading for the last few weeks of my life. I wasn't sure I'd make it this far, but he's the final obstacle for us in the challenge. Once the credits roll, this challenge is over, and he's the one thing standing between us and the taste of victory. For some reason, the game developers decided that giving Evice Pokemon that were in their early 60s is fair, even though the trainers right before him only have Pokemon in their late 40s. The game plan for Evice was as follows. Don't let him set up and play as absolutely carefully as possible. His team is disgustingly monstrous, and I play the battle to the absolute best of my ability. I have to be as careful as possible, because one slip up and we might lose the entire thing. He leads with Slacking and Scizor, both hugely problematic Pokemon for my team. Because we led with Hitmontop and Umbreon, we're actually able to get off an Intimidate, which will help a lot. We go for a Brick Break on the Slacking with Hitmontop and a Fan Attack from Umbreon. Slacking sets up a Bulk Up and Scizor sets up a Sword Stance, so we're put in a difficult position. Thinking that Brick Break will kill, we go for another one on the Slacking, as he's unable to move this turn because of Truant. We also swap out Umbreon for Entei, so I don't want him taking a plus one Silver win from the Scizor. Unfortunately, Brick Break doesn't kill the Slacking, it literally lives on like 1 HP, and Silverwind gets a critical hit on my Entei. So now we have a huge problem for next turn. I spend about 2 minutes or so weighing my options, trying to do my best to make sure that no one dies this turn, and I decide the best course of action is to protect with Hitmontop to make sure that Slacking can't kill him, and go into Yanma to avoid the Earthquake. Earthquake hits neither of my Pokemon, but hits Scizor for around half health. Scizor then outright sets up, goes for another Swords Dance right in my face. So Scizor is at plus three, the Slacking's at plus one defense, and I'm still scared. I want to get rid of this Slacking before he heals it, but interestingly, he uses an X attack on it and a full restore on the Scizor, when I thought he might do the other way around because Scizor has half health and Slacking only has like 1 HP. We kill the Slacking with a wing attack, and we hit the Scizor for some damage with Brick Break. Now Scizor is sitting pretty at plus 3 attack, but I can't kill him with anything other than a flamethrower from Entei, because nothing has enough attack power to do that much damage besides that. Slacking goes down, Salamance comes in, and he hits my team with an Intimidate, preventing us from doing much more substantial damage. Everything in this battle is terrifying. One slip up and I'm done. I figure someone's gonna die. I'm glad I bought those TMs for Protect because it came in handy here. I send in Entei for Yanma and Protect with him on top. Entei then has to take an Aerial Ace from the Salamence and a plus 3 Metal Claw from Scizor, living only on 18 HP. But we got him in relatively safely. I heal up Entei with a full restore during him on top's turn and I get off a flamethrower on Scizor, killing it and eliminating the threat. I'm really relieved, but we're still not close to done with the battle. He sends in Machamp, and Salamence hits Hitmontop with an Aerial Ace, coming close to killing, he lived on 35 HP. I think about what to do, and who can potentially take hits the best, and I settle on going into Umbreon. I hit the Machamp with a flamethrower, which he takes pretty nicely, it does less than half, and Umbreon gets hit with an Aerial Ace. Machamp is the threat at this point, and goes for an Earthquake, hitting both of my Pokémon for big damage. I heal up Umbreon with Entei's turn, and go for a Psychic on Machamp. Salamence goes for Dragon Claw, and I killed kills my Entei. I didn't know what he was going to do, and unfortunately our prized Entei goes down turn 8 of the battle. Psychic's not enough to kill Machamp, and I send in Yanma to replace Entei. Machamp goes for another Earthquake, hits Umbreon for some damage, but doesn't hit Yanma because obviously Yanma is a flying type. Turn 9, I protect with Yanma, thinking he'll go for an Aerial Ace, which he does, and I kill the Machamp with another Psychic. He sends in Slowking to replace Machamp, and I wonder what I should do here, as Yanma's not safe with Salamence on the field. I run the risk, and I go for a second Protect in a row, and I Toxic the Salamence with Umbreon. Unfortunately, the Protect fails, and Yanma goes down to an Aerial Ace from the Salamence. I never thought I'd be sad to see a Yanma die, but here we are. You did great, Yanma. 
better than I could have imagined. The upside of this is I get to bring in Meganium for free to help take down the Slowking. Turn 11, I use Giga Drain on the Slowking and get back a lot of my health. Salamence outspeeds me and hits me with an Aerial Ace beforehand, but luckily Meganium lived with enough HP. I then feint attacked with Umbreon, and I finished off the Slowking before he could do any real damage to my team. We're sitting at 4 Pokemon to 2 Pokemon. He only has Tyranitar, and his Salamence left, and I think we're in a pretty good position to win the battle. The Sandstorm also comes up, which is doing chip damage to everyone, including Salamence. I use this turn to heal Meganium fully and go for another Giga Drain on Tyranitar, which does about half. Evice has the same idea as me, unfortunately, and uses another Full Restore on his Salamence, getting rid of the Toxic I worked so hard to get on him. He then uses an X Attack on his Tyranitar, which is definitely not a good thing. I want to confuse the Salamence to hopefully stop him from getting a move off every turn, and I go for another Giga Drain on the Tyranitar, hoping to finish it off. Unfortunately, the game has other plans, and before I can do anything, Salamence hits Meganium with a critical hit Aerial Ace and one-shots it. I was floored. I thought that would cost me the battle entirely. It's now a much, much closer game. Of course the RNG gods wouldn't be on my side. I debated about who to send in for like two or three minutes now that we were completely out of defensive options. I'm worried that a Shadow Rush from Tyranitar will outright kill the Plusle if I send her in. So, I decide the best play Send in him on top to get the Intimidate attack drop, and sacrifice him for the greater good. He does his job, and unfortunately falls victim to the Tyranitar, with another, more insulting, critical hit. Now, it's 2v2. Umbreon and Plusle versus Tyranitar and Salamance. Turn 14 decides the game. I go for Toxic on the Salamance, and Thunderbolt on the Tyranitar, hoping that we'd be able to kill it before it could kill me. Salamence double edges and Tyranitar shadow rushes, and they gang up on my Plusle to kill her. Now it's a 1v2. Umbreon versus the world. Victory is slipping. I have to full restore to get us back up to full health to potentially take two hits from both of these Pokemon. Luckily, Salamence hits itself in its confusion, and Tyranitar goes for a rock slide and does minor damage. Keep in mind, both Sandstorm damage and Toxic are chipping away at this Salamence. Evice makes a last ditch effort to have Salamence Dragon Dance, and I outspeed the Tyranitar and finish it off with a faint attack. More Toxic damage, more Sandstorm damage, it's now 1v1, Umbreon v Salamence. I once again heal Umbreon with a full restore, and laugh maniacally as the Salamence double edges, killing itself and giving us the victory with only Umbreon left standing at the end of it. Oh good, now Egan shows up. What took him so long? Oh yeah, hey Duking. Yeah, I killed your Plusle, dude, my bad. Thank you all for watching. That was a Pokemon Colosseum Vanilla Nuzlocke. Also, please, for the love of everything, do not try this on your own. This was torturous. It was so difficult and so much thought had to be put into every single thing that I did. So much time, so much effort. Please don't do it. It's double battles. It's a lot of grinding. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> or maybe it was worth it. I don't know. That's okay. Whatever. I didn't even know if it was going to be possible. I drafted my strategy and did everything back in July. It's been like four months that this project has been in the works and I got distracted with some PFL stuff, um, but we were finally able to bring it to you guys, and I gotta tell you, this is the most work and the most assets that I've ever had to create for a project. Having this be post-commentated, having the layouts, uh, all the grinding and the time that I had to put into this, it was just absolute, it was crazy. It was a huge project, and I'm so glad that we were able to come out victorious, even if it was just Umbreon at the very end of it. That was. Very sad. It was really sad to see Yanma go, to see Plusle go, but what are you going to do? We did it. Anyways, Sword and Shield. Sword and Shield comes out tomorrow, tomorrow night at midnight uh, at the time of this video. And I'm going to be doing a blind Nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield. And it's not going to be like this. It's not going to be post-commentated. It's going to be straight up me playing the game, 
Not sure if there's going to be a face cam in there. We're going to see how it works with my Elgato and recording capture software and whatever. But I'm very excited for that. I've really wa I've wanted to play like an actual Pokemon game that wasn't Colosseum for so long, but I just knew I had to keep grinding Colosseum um, just because I had to get this part out there. Um, thank you guys so much for all the support. Uh, this has been probably the most viewed thing that I've done uh, as of as of right now. Um, make sure to subscribe, leave a like. This is a, this is a crazy amount of work. This has been a this has been a ride. You, you guys don't even understand. It's been a ride. I did not think I was going to be able to pull this off at all, but I did it. I'm happy with it. Um, everybody, have a great day. Sword and Shield coming your way. Uh, that's going to be a ton of fun. I literally can't wait to do all of that. Um, Till next time.